just to give you a heads up in this episode of the Churchy Shed podcast, there is talk of real and actual wartime combat stories throughout. So if you're sensitive to that kind of thing, do whatever you need to do. And also want to let you know you got to stick around to the very end uh, after the podcast is over. There's some cool maps, uh, Iraqi hand-drawn maps and photos and kind of helps you wrap your head around um, the, the stories that Billy goes over throughout the episode a little bit better. So stick around at the end and check those out. Enjoy the episode. <laughs> I've done a couple of these before, so good for you. Because I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, uh, I'll introduce our guest for today, who's sitting right next to me. Billy Iams. I've never actually said your last name to you. Is that how you say it? Iams. Yeah, like the dog food or like pet the, food. Yeah. Pet food. Sponsorship. Yeah, yeah exactly. Will. So I say a lot of really, I'm, I'm the dumb guy saying dumb stuff. So you feel free to like, look at me funny look, at any time. Like what's wrong hundred percent. I already have twice. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Iams uh, is a former staff sergeant in the United States Marine Corps. And he served in the Iraq war from um, quick one. Yeah, the, the first uh, Desert Storm, I guess, is what they call yeah. it now. <clears throat> Operation Desert Storm, you served yeah, exactly. in that. exactly. Served in that, and um, I was in the Marine Corps from 1980 to 1992, so 12 years. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. So exactly. I, that was, that's, my, that's <laughs> junior, that's uh, grade school, junior high, and high school. Exactly. Right? So, yeah. When did you go to grade school? I, w- I was in grade school from 81 until 80 what would that be 86 87 okay junior high was 87 to 89 and high school was 90 to 94 and you almost have as much gray as i do (laughs) i do isn't that sad (laughs) you've been doing some good living um as well so then after iraq war and you are now uh currently a construction coordinator in this big hollywood world this is true major motion feature films major motion pictures Correct. That's your current position. Correct. Construction coordinator. Cool. Yes. Well, let's, I, I want to, so how I know you, I want to start with that. You're my neighbor. This is true. We live four doors down from each other on this opposite is, sides of the street. This is true. And you always drive by and we have through the car window conversations that are pretty amazing. So that's why I wanted to have you on the show because of, you know, being in the Marine Corps and the crazy big time movies that you work on. And you're always gone and you're always working. And I see you leave at four o'clock in the fucking morning. True. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I've been basically gone for two years in Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. You're always going to, well, and you're going to Georgia, Atlanta, different countries at times. And we'll get to that. Okay. But I do want to back up. Okay. So the Marine Corps experience to me, I'm enamored by basically i'll just call them war stories for the for the lack of a better term and so start back i'm guessing you went straight from high school into the marine corps i did so i got out of i was uh born and raised in uh, burbank okay so i graduated john burroughs high school and uh, joined the marine corps in 80. <clears throat> um my first unit was first battalion ninth marines which was the walking dead the famous Walking Dead of uh, the Marine Corps. So did, what, why do they call them Walking Dead? They call them the Walking Dead because half their unit was wiped out in Vietnam in an ambush. And um, so they called them the Walking Dead from a battle basically that they kind of lost. And they were the 9th Marines were stationed in Okinawa, Japan. So like within 90, 60 days of me getting out of boot camp to 90 days, I was uh, with 1-9 uh, um, in Okinawa, Japan. So as a, like within six months, me getting out of the Marine Corps was already in Japan with an infantry unit. So it was kind of like a so that was opener. roughly what, like what eighty four? No, that was eighty eighty one. Yeah, it was eighty eighty one. Yeah, so 81. we're fresh off the Vietnam War. Yeah, we are. All my NCOs, all my staff sergeants and gunnies and first sergeants were all Vietnam vets, and so that was uh, very interesting. There was a lot of still racial segregation in the military and what yeah it was, it was so what were those times. so we'll get to that so we'll get to the racial thing and then what what about the guys that you you know the guys above you they had to be just rough oh hard they just came through vietnam oh yeah hardcore smokers drinkers you know um <laughs> They didn't care about anyone's feelings, which, you know, you're in the Marine Corps anyway, so right. feelings kind of go out the door 
Yeah. You know, the first. And there uh, were no hashtags back then. No, not to at save all. Save you? No, not at all. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of <clears throat> uh, loan sharking still going on. There's a lot of uh, uh, card games with tons of money and people borrowing, you know, betting their paychecks and having to borrow money. And <clears throat> so it was a very interesting time in the Marine Corps. And then, you know, basically uh, Ronald Reagan was elected president after Jimmy Carter. And then he spent a lot of time and money kind of investing in the Marine Corps. He definitely enjoyed his Marines and had a lot of Marines around him a lot of times. And so we kind of cleaned up the Marine Corps, I think, during the Ronald Reagan years. Okay, so kind yeah. of like the aftermath of Vietnam. More, exactly. Would... More money, more funding. You know, we kind of got our, our morale back, you know. So you, when you say clean it up, like organization. Exactly. Unparalleled in the history of man, man, man. You get out of high school and you go through basic. Where was basic? Uh, I'm a Hollywood Marine, so that would mean San Diego. Okay. Yeah, I didn't go to Camp Lejeune. Okay. And then, so when I was in Okinawa, they had this uh, this yearly competition in the uh, Marine Corps, and it's called Super Squad. And like infantry units have their best squad, and they go and they compete, and uh, it's a Marine Corps wide competition. And the unit I was with, I was elected to join the Super Squad. And so we ended up, make a long story short, ended up going to Quantico, Virginia and winning second place in the Marine Corps wide Super Squad competition. Okay. And you compete in what? And, you know, uh, infantry skills like, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember so damn long ago. Was it like, like, do you, do you like, like infantry skills, like, uh, attacks and raids and like, uh, uh, Different. physical, physical fitness. So like throwing a ruck, 50 yeah, yeah, pound rucksack it's, it's, on and uh, running a hundred percent stuff like that. And, um, and so once, um, I became, uh, our unit, the, uh, the super squad that I was in with first battalion, ninth Marines, um, uh, we came in second place. At that time, we did our six-month tour, and we were back in Camp Pendleton, and I had a chance when I got back from Super Scott to join Recon, to go and try out for Marine Corps Recon. Okay. And um, so I went and tried out, and obviously I... And now Marine Corps Recon, just kind of give a little bit about, like, what... Well, they're is, like the eyes and ears of the uh, Marine Corps. They're okay. like go behind enemy lines. They do raids. They do, you know, surveillance stuff. You okay. Know? And so. Uh, so you're going to, so to dumb it down for somebody like dumb like me, you're going to see more action. You're going to see yeah. a mission. It's, it's the Marine Corps Special Operations guys. Okay. Yeah. They're okay. like, uh, they have uh, uh, Marine Recon force recon and now they call them the marine raiders which is basically the marine corps special operations command which is sometimes called what marsoc marsoc okay right right exactly and so basically um i spent a tour at first recon in camp pendleton um then beirut started in 1983 we were <clears throat> in beirut ah. and um they took four or five of us from first recon and they sent us to um, Europe. I ended up in London, England, um, at Marine Barracks there. And one of our jobs, my jobs, was uh, protecting the admiral. I was a flag orderly, they called him. And so we would, I would basically escort the admiral wherever he went. Um, it was kind of funny because you get to London and you get a thousand pounds, and you have to go buy suits and jackets and shoes, and you're wearing suits sometimes and over. Um, over jackets carrying guns you know so it was kind of a new experience for me that way so you were sort of kind of like uh the secret service within the marine corps well, to protect the, we, the admiral exactly they, they called them flag orderlies at the time and there was three of us that rotated okay and we were guarding a gentleman named admiral holcomb who was the third or the second in charge of uh all of europe all of the naval forces in Europe. Wow. Yeah, so he was, uh, Stacer Holcomb was his name. I'm not sure if he's still alive, but... Um, so I just envision you literally, like, sitting there with dark glasses on, no, and thing in your ear, standing they, behind they, him. They had NIS that did the driving and everything, naval, but we just basically was, were basically his uh, protection, okay. like arm protection. Ah. And so um, when people would come and visit, 
the Admiral, like William Casey came, the director of the CIA came to the uh, to London one day. We were across the street from uh, the embassy um, in Grosvenor Square in London. And so that's where our naval headquarters was in Europe. And so big di diplomats would come by and like I said, William Casey stopped by once or tw twice um, right after the Achille Laurel happened and came by and talked to Admiral Holcomb. So remind us of what, what, what was that again? The, the Achille Laurel was um, a terrorist that uh, boarded a cruise ship and killed um, a couple of passengers, a, a gentleman in a wheelchair. They okay. killed also, and then I think uh, they were all killed okay. eventually by, I think, a SEAL team. Yeah, and I can flash a link up yeah, here exactly. for that so, so you know exactly what that is because that's, inter that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, and then from there, um, I spent two years there in London, England, and then I went to a third recon in Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii, and um, I spent three years there. Um, and then I went and spent a year. So what year are we at about now? <clears throat> We're at 85, 86, 87. Okay. Then in 1988, I spent a year at Special Operations Training Group in Okinawa, Japan. And then I came back to 3rd Recon in Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii. And a year later, we went uh, within three weeks of the Gulf um, or I. Iraq invading Kuwait three weeks later we were already in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia so I was with the 1st Marine Brigade which is basically out of 1st Marine Brigade is out of Kaneohe Bay Hawaii years ago I don't know what they, it is now so wherever there is a hot spot okay the 1st Marine Brigade out of Kaneohe Bay would react it was kind of like a 82nd Airborne so you guys were like first we're, man up we're gone yeah, okay. We were gone. So you say you were already in Saudi Arabia. So I'm just going to remember my recollection of how Desert Storm started. I remember when Iraq invaded Kuwait and you were already in Saudi Arabia when that happened or they sent you to Saudi Arabia the day that happened. Uh, we were there three weeks afterwards. Three weeks afterwards. Yeah. So basically right yeah. after. Right afterwards. Okay. And then uh, we were basically up uh, a place called... Uh, uh, the town of Kafchi, we were Al Mashab, which is below it, uh, which was with uh, Kafchi, Saudi Arabia. Kafchi, Saudi Arabia, um, and we were with uh, the uh, First Marine Division, but we were with the Third Marine Regiment, which is basically uh, um, the Kaneohe, um, Kaneohe Bay. Uh, but what was so interesting about it is, so Camp Pendleton got there, First Marine Division. Second Marine Division got there, and then we got there. So, um, Second Marine Division was Task Force Ripper, I think. Um, First Marine Division was Task Force Shepherd. We are Task Force Tarot. Tarot? <laughs> yeah. Like tarot cards? Tarot, like the tarot route from Hawaii, because oh. we're from Hawaii. Oh, okay. So, all these. People have all these fucking badass names, right? Ripper, Shepherd, and we're like, you guys are Task Force Taro. Plant, you guys are plant based. <laughs> so we're kind of like, plant -based what the hell? What, what, what kind of hell uh, names that? Task Force Taro. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like the Plumeria. Okay, you guys are Task Force Plumeria. Task Force Bougainvillea. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of odd, and, and we ended up seeing all the most action too. Yeah. The whole thing. Which, which will get so to to kind of like. For me, be, again, being the dummy, you guys are there. You're, are you there before the army is there? Your first boots on the ground. We are. When we're so the <clears throat> we were there before the set, 82nd Airborne. We were there before the first red, you know, the uh, uh, the, the big red one, the first, you know, the tank division. Yeah. Before Camp Pendleton, before. Okay. Yeah, and all that time, like all the shipping's coming in, all the NPS maritime preposition shipping. So when I remember I was in junior high school and we still have Walkmans mm -hmm. and we, me and all my friends, as soon as desert storm started, we were, we had our Walkmans hidden in our back pockets and we, we would put the, we were listening to the war cause it, th this was new. Like we missed Vietnam. Sure. You know, so I'm at this point, 12, 13 years old and completely enamored by the military i was i loved 
jets and just like the the tactics of it and the firearms and everything you know like a typical midwest boy i was pretty that i would i think it's fair to say i was pretty typical back yeah, then 100 percent. so listening to the all the airstrikes going on and then sure. going home at night and being able to watch them on cnn was amazing to me you were there while that was going on already. yeah we were actually probably calling airstrikes that you're watching on tv too so, so you were calling those out saying yeah. like where stuff sure. is you guys the for example when we were so our our recon unit our platoon which is three teams had the task of going into this town of coffee which had, had already been evacuated the saudi arabia government had evacuated all the residents out of the town and so we were in doing patrols around the town we were in buildings we were in people's houses and we were observing the enemy on the opposing side we were right on the border so we could see the iraqis the iraqis could see us basically or knew that we were there and so for instance uh we had more than once at in the uh evening a mlr multiple rocket launcher come down on the enemy side and shoot ML, uh, multiple rockets over to where um, our third marine headquarters was and so the, this is them this is the this Iraqi, Iraqi shooting shooting over you guys over the town of Kachi and hitting the uh, trying to hit the Marines at third marine division and the call sign would always be mail call mail call we would see it coming and so we got smart to it and they sent us out they sent my team out and we uh, saw it coming and we had a combat air patrol over us, a cap, and he shot his rockets. And from my position, we shot an azimuth to where the multiple rocket was. Plane came over my position on that um, azimuth, and he obviously, his rocket pods were hot. So the jet just turned on his heat seeking missile and blew that fucker right up out of the street. Saw it tumbling okay so i'm i'm gonna back up to well that's crazy. so this is before i remember there being a big deal of it's only airstrikes now we're not sending troops in yet so this is that happened still when we hadn't said we're not sending it we, we're still at the point of we're not sending boots sure. on the ground into anywhere yet other than sitting in saudi arabia sure getting ready but but what what probably wasn't reported on the news was all the uh, border clashes. Yeah. That, no. See, that the, special you saying force, that SF you had teams, uh, stuff shot over your head had, is news We to had me. first recon, force recon teams having border battles. Um, I think they were testing us, you know, to see what our defenses were. Yeah, see, and none we of were, that. You were just pounding the shit out of them with the air. So, you know, they had a hard time trying to figure out what our defenses were. And I remember, to the scuds the, and that when they would shoot they were shooting scuds at us and then we would hit them with what we would always intercept them we would and that was the job of the british sas to go track down the scud launchers okay so, so you guys british, were working with the british well the um the british were already deep inside iraq they were like in baghdad iraq they were miles and miles we were still defending the iraqi um, with the Kuwait and Saudi border, where the Iraqis were, basically. Okay. Um, but up there in Kafi, there was some... Uh, we had two Special Forces teams. There was uh, uh, two or three Force Recon teams from 1st Marine Division. And there was a th unit called SRIG, which is a surveillance team, but it was basically just collecting electronic information. Okay. You know, so we're all operating out of the town, town of Kachi. Yeah. Okay. And what in what part of Saudi Arabia is that? It's in the, it's in the, it's in the uh, northeast. northeast. So it's just, yeah. So it's uh, it's basically in the Red Sea. Okay. Oh, excuse me. The uh, Persian Gulf. Persian Gulf. Yeah. yeah. It's in the Persian Gulf. See, these are the things that, you know, you see movies like, Jarhead, you've seen the movie Jarhead? No, I have bits and pieces. You just can't watch it? No, I mean, the guy's a pussy. Doesn't he fire his rifle once? Yeah, well, that's... And he's the... supposed to be some big-ass combat vet, and, you know, it's like, where, I don't know, it just didn't make sense to me. 
And is it accurate? Because I, th- the, what I got from that movie is that there was this big buildup, and we were all gung ho, and everybody was like just ready to fight, and then we were on the precipice of getting boots on the ground and going in, and then nothing. Those guys, I don't know if they were in the army or if they were Marines. I can't, I, I can't remember either. But then, like, they never got to. Yeah, exactly. And it you, all. It, and it's true. A lot of you know, some units saw a lot of heavy battles. Some. You, you know, units didn't. But they made anything. it out to be like there was really no battle. Like we right. went in to battle them and there wasn't. But you've already said oh, yeah, we, little border scuffles here and there were never talked about. Yeah. And then, of course, the whole, the whole battle of Kashi, you know, where, you know, thousands of, you know, uh, Iraqis were killed by us, you know, so. Yeah. So go into. So then go go into that. Then I, I, I know that. I don't know if that's part of. The, so basically. Yeah, so basically we were. So I want to set this up. Yeah. So we were the major ahead. the major ground battles. There was basically there weren't many in the uh, uh, the Gulf War, but the ones that the one that did that you just mentioned, Kafji, the ones that did happen, you were part of. A hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was a team leader. There's three. Uh, so basically, what happened was uh, the Iraqis attacked us in the town of Kafji. And we had, uh, in our, my platoon, our platoon, we had three teams. We would rotate in and out of Kafji all the time. Uh, the night that they had attacked Kafji, um, they came rolling in with uh, tanks, uh, BMPs, uh, all sorts of troop carriers. So basically probably um, 800 to 3,000 Iraqi troops came into the town of Kafji. And where are you, are you sitting there literally, where are you physically? Are you watching them? So I had just left the town. Okay. Okay, I had just rotated out. Uh, Chuck Ingram and Larry Lentz, the other two team leaders, were in the town. They were told to stay there. So basically they were in a position where they thought they could not get caught in a, you know, in, in a safe position where they could report and they ended up being surrounded, both teams. Chuck ended up on a rooftop. Um, his team, his five-man team. Um, so when you say team leader, these are five-man teams? Five-man teams. And how many? Five to six-man teams. So it's only you five in Kafji? That's it. So there's two teams, so there's ten guys in Kafji. That's it. With 800 to so 1,500 guys surrounding them. So when you say I want to be part of recon, yeah, that's what you're signing up for. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? No. So so you're so those, so Larry and those guys are there. You had just rotated out. And so, so we could we knew that. No, obviously they're reporting. Hey man, these guys are coming in. They're coming in. So I grab four guys. Um, we head up to Kafji. And where did you go when you rotate out? Where we you- went back to our, uh, our, like our CP, our little headquarters that we had, which was basically a bulldozer had dug a big hole in the ground, and we put a cami net over it, and that's kind of where we lived. Okay. In, in one of those. And how far away from Kafji were you? Uh, probably eight kilometers. Okay. Probably, you know, six to eight miles at, at the most. And so um, what had happened, uh, so by the time we had got back up to Kafji, the Saudis were there, the, Qu- the Qataris were there, and um, they came up with a plan to attack Kafji. And so I was with myself, my uh, platoon commander, Dan Pikowski, a radio man, and we had an interpreter with us, a Saudi ter- interpreter. And um, so we had this meeting with a general, a Saudi general, and a Qatari colonel. Um, there was a gentleman there named Joe Malowski. He's passed away now, but he was basically like a UN guy. He was a Marine, but he was the uh, liaison between the United States and the Saudi government. Okay. All right. He was a, a captain at the time. Because they're allowing you guys yeah, to exactly, be there. And, exactly. And, and so, they welcomed you, right? Exactly. Okay. And, the, and, and the plan was they were going to attack and everything like that. And we were going to, um, you know, we knew where our, our teams were. They were safe for that night. This is the first night. And so <clears throat> they get in a, a armored column 
and they start going into the town of Kachi, and they're probably a half mile outside the town, and I'm in the chaplain's Jeep that we stole from him, and it says Amazing Grace on it, the front of it, and all of a sudden... Just a Jeep. All these... Uh, yeah, just a Humvee. All, the, all of a sudden, all these fuckers stop. All the tanks and everything, and we keep on going, and I'm looking, and I'm driving, and now I'm leading the whole armor calm. There's all these guys have stopped behind us. Stop. So tanks. Tanks, APCs, all the troops have stopped. And they're, and, they're, and that's the Saudi. And the Saudi and the Qataris. They completely stopped. And, and within. And nobody was on a radio saying, why are we stopping? Why are we stopping? We're, we're, yeah, we're like, what the hell is going on? Within 15 seconds, all hell broke loose. The Saudis unleashed on the. I mean, excuse me, the Iraqis unleashed on the Saudis. The Saudis started firing back. We're caught in the crossfire now. So I ditched the vehicle into an abandoned gas station or a gas station that is abandoned. <laughs> and we get out of the Jeep and we go inside the gas station and everyone's freaking out. The whole gas station's taking bullets. We're taking bullets everywhere. And back there, they had an oil changing station that you could walk down into the oh yeah yeah right? where the guys are exactly yeah so the so jiffy lube you're hiding in a jiffy lube the, exactly the the, <laughs> the saudi interpreter that we had starts throwing up right oh he, my god he just starts that throwing been me. up he starts throwing up he starts freaking out he starts curling up in a ball he starts crying right um so not a marine not not a marine <laughs> and so we're trying to uh you know tell the Saudi Arabians to stop firing, right? They're f just lighting up the gas station on us. And so we get a ceasefire, and um, we hear noise outside. So myself and Dan Pikowski, we go outside the back of the gas, gas station, and there's an a Iraqi a BTR-60 sitting there, an a, a armored personnel carrier. And Dan takes a law rocket off his shoulder and um, takes aim out of it and clicks it and took, forgot to take it off safety, right? That'd Clocks be me. it again, cocked yeah. it again, and boom, shoots right through the side of it and blows up the uh, APC. We go around, we look inside. We don't see anybody in it, but it's on fire at the time, right? Because yeah. you shot a, a rocket through it. So it's just me and Dan Pikowski at the time. He's a captain at the time. I'm a sergeant at the time. Um, I'm the senior team leader in the platoon. So we. So captain and sergeant, what just from dumb well, it down? Like he's a. Uh, he's in charge of you, or you're in charge? No, of no, he's a, he's in charge of he's in charge of the uh, platoon. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a great guy. We still keep in contact monthly. So we we go around the corner. He fires, misfires the first time. The second time he. Fires through the uh, Iraqi uh, armor vehicle. We go around. It's all on fire. We can't see anything in it. There's a couple. And you're shoulder to shoulder with them. Oh yeah, we you know we're all geared up. We have a, uh, um, um, we're fully loaded with ammo, grenades, and everything. We go back around the corner, and in the back of the gas station looks like a little service office and everything. The doors ajar, and we can hear shit in there. And so there's only two of us. And, you know, obviously we're well-trained. We, I've, you know, been in recon for almost 10 years or nine years at the time. So, you know, I've been through like every, every school, every school Sorry. possible when it comes to, to, you know, yeah. you know, combat wise, you know, so we go around the corner and we see the building and we just decide that we're not going to go in the building. And we just took off two grenades and threw them in there and the entire building blew up. All the windows blew out and everything. So when that oh, okay, so this is a separate building. Behind yes, behind the gas, the gas station. station. Okay. So when all, when that happened, all hell breaks loose again. Again. So the Iraqis start firing at us. The and you guys Saudis, are out in the open. We're now. out in the open. Um, Dan's on the on the radio trying to tell there is a uh, there is an a, a an American colonel with the Saudis, and his call sign was Coyote. He was a Vietnam veteran. He's a colonel, <clears throat> and so we're trying to get a hold of Coyote to tell him stop firing at us shut, shut it the fuck down <laughs> shut it the fuck down so he that that actually happens so it probably takes another minute 
and but but you're just oh we're getting ding ding everywhere. and this is at night this is totally pitch dark at night so you but there's tracers oh, and there's stuff tracers right over your head firing, bouncing around bouncing you. everywhere and so we get a ceasefire we make it back to the gas station around the front and out of nowhere like this five ton Saudi truck just pulls up and there's two Saudis there and we're trying to tell them don't go any further I don't know what you guys are doing to get you got to turn around and um, they didn't listen to us and they took another 300 400 meters and they just got blown up I mean the whole vehicle was completely torn apart and so the rest of the night the vehicle was still running, so the rest of the night, until we got out of there, we could hear the tires just go, wow, 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 over and over and over. Oh, my God. <clears throat> so at this, at this point, um, Dan and I are like, okay, let's try to get into the city. So we grab some more law so rockets. So go farther forward farther, towards yeah. this truck that just got blown exactly. up. Exactly. So um, we, were not, we were off the road. And you had permission to do all this, right? Well, because of your recon. Yeah, so we were recon. They knew we were there. Um, so we, Kashi, the, how you get into the town of Kashi, there's two beautiful arches. They look like McDonald arches, but they're basically done in, you know, an Arabic, like, sword-type arches. Okay. And so... I'll bring up a picture if we have we, it. We, uh, we ran to the arches, Dan and I, and we were like, okay, let's see if we can get close to the teams, get them out of here, or try to, you know, fight our way in. So you're five, so you're on the outside. So your five guys are in the middle of Kafji. Two teams. And they're like the whole and Kafji is completely taken over taken by, by the, the taken Iraqis. over by the Iraqis. They have a hundred percent surrounded. Um, they are both teams are surrounded. And so that's the first night. And so we get up to the, the gate and we can start hearing mechanized vehicles moving towards us like tanks and APCs and everything. And we decide that it probably would be best if we didn't. So we made it back. And you're just hiding. You're just we're hiding. hiding against yeah, we're fences. Hiding. We're, we're hiding against uh, fences and everything. And so we made it back to the gas station. We're like, okay, we, we, we got to get out of here. And so we call everybody and let them know we're going to take our vehicle and we're going to move out of the gas station and head back to the Saudi Arabia with the rest of the, the group that we're separated from. And how far back <coughs> are they from oh, the gas Oh, they're probably station? from uh, probably a quarter mile. Okay. Yeah, probably so a quarter ways. mile. Yeah, ways. And so as soon as we leave the gas station, all shit breaks loose again. You got, so they saw they're you. They're firing at us. There's a Iraqi um, tank. Uh, uh, Iraqi fired and hit a Qatari tank right in front of us, and the whole turret, the whole tank just flipped over on its side. It was the freakiest thing I've ever seen in my life. And we, we, we just didn't even get near them. We just headed out to the desert <laughs> away from everybody. <laughs> Holy shit. It's that night. And so as we're going, someone shoots a tow missile at us, right, at our vehicle. From the Iraqi side. From the, no, so not from friendly. the Saudi side. Oh, so friendly fire. So friendly fire. We get a tow missile fired at us. And I don't know how, the luck of God, we we're in the chaplain's vehicle. I went just by a chain link fence, and that thing hit a chain link fence and blew up. Holy shit. Yeah, so if it wouldn't crazy. hit the chain link fence, it's hitting the Jeep. It's hitting the Jeep. So that's the first night. We wake up the next morning, right? It, now, this is like a 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. And, You've been up all night. And, and the Arabs don't fight at night. They just don't fight at night. So once that was over, everyone went back to there, and they made their coffee. They got in their blankets and went to bed. <clears throat> the next morning, we organized. Um, uh, all hell broke loose the next morning. Um, Chuck and... Um, Meanwhile, the Chuck five Ingram. guys are still in there. So Chuck Ingram and Larry Lentz, now they start calling in artillery fire on the Iraqis in the city. So the, these recon team guys are surrounded, and they're calling in fucking artillery on themselves too. Chuck had uh, an air burst came down, and some guy got one of the team's members. Uh, uh, Jeff Brown got hit in the leg with shrapnel. So these guys were calling in danger close missions basically on top of their Because they had no choice. They had no choice. They were totally surrounded. They were setting up claymores in the uh, stairways in case Iraqis came up. And the, you, these five guys, they're just, are they just in a building? They're, uh, Larry's in a building. Chuck is on top of a roof, totally exposed to so all this. So he's still up that, there. He's still on the roof. He spent the night on the roof. 
So this is the second day. Um, so now they start calling in fire. Um, they start calling in artillery. Um, they called in a couple fast movers. And then right when the sun came up, we watched the uh, surface to air missile uh, shoulder launch, um, unfortunately, go up and hit Spirit 03. Spirit 03 is the last um, Spectre gunship to get shot down in combat. Okay. So 17 crew members were lost that day. Um, so it's a gunship. It's a big... It's a, yeah, it's a gunship. So it's got the Catlin guns on it. It's like Puff the Magic Dragon. Okay. It's a Spectre gunship. So okay. it, it, they were for JSOC, Special Operations Command. They knew that the teams were in trouble, and they stayed on station, and they exposed themselves when the sun came up, and an Iraqi shoulder launch missile um, shot down Spirit 03 that morning. Oh, shit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's a big thing at McDill Air Force Base in Florida. You can look at, and they each year they honor the Spirit 03. There's a whole story on it about how they stayed on station to, to uh, help our, <sighs> our team. Yeah. So after that happened, that's um, a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. How old are you at this time? You so this I'm, happens right uh, in front I'm of your 27. eyes. I'm 27. You're 27. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm a senior guy at that point in 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 recon. So. But still, you're oh, 20, it's heavy duty. To boil it down to brass tacks, you're a 27 year old, and you yeah. just saw 100. percent Yeah. You know. Sure. A big group of your guys go down. Exactly. Um, so uh, that after that happened, um, the assault of. The Battle of Coffee basically happened. We just started calling in airstrikes. Um, the Saudi Coyote, the lieutenant colonel, and the Saudi colonel basically just started going in and wiping out Iraqis. I think, I don't know, there's probably 800 to, they say, 1,100 Iraqis killed during the battle there. And so we went in with the main battle group. I picked up Chuck's team. Uh, in the... In the- <laughs> In the chaplain's jeep. In the chaplain's jeep. Is it a Humvee a, or a jeep? It's a it's a Humvee. Okay. Amazing Grace, and so. Um, so you literally roll up like, hey guys, hop it's, in. It's in the book. It's crazy. Where's there's an Iraqi tank. So there's an Iraqi sorry. tank there, and everything, and uh, uh, they came scurrying down the street, and we just all jumped in the Humvee, and we just took off across the desert, man, and everyone was just like, totally beat up totally beat up after but all five of them all, all everyone five of them. Every, all of us made it out and so later that day Lentz made it out three hours later he came rolling down the highway with every single tire blown out from artillery so all all four tires were flat from shrapnel and he was driving on flat tires out of, out of coffee holy shit yeah okay let me let me let me try to get some numbers here so there's five guys you're five guys trapped in Kopchi. two teams you, of five two teams of five so there's 10 guys in yeah trapped in Kopchi. correct all in one building two two, two separate, separate buildings correct okay so they called in airstrikes on themselves then the next morning the saudi team and the qataris and qataris yep. and then you and your buddy so only two of you guys yep roll in with them back yep. to the McDonald's arches to Kafji yep. and they just, and them and airstrikes just start obliterating all the Iraqis in Kafji. hundred percent. And you ride in with them getting shot at and go and find both groups of five or you just found well, them. One. I, I just picked up Chuck Ingram, just Chuck Ingram and his group of guys, and yeah. his group of guys. And you got the fuck out of there, got the fuck out of there. And the other five guys come rolling in on flat tires. Yep later all yep. five of them yep because they're getting shot up yep so i mean how do you how the fuck do you survive that how do, how do you not get hit you just, it was just i mean you're just good you're well, good I think at that hiding it's, it's yeah good at hiding and then i think that you know your mental like as a recon team leader during that time my mental capacity was like way stronger than it is now yeah you're you know not thinking I mean? about like oh shit no. i die you're just thinking about yeah. we're I, we're gonna yeah we're, we're gonna do this yeah i mean like this is what we're trained to do exactly why die for your country and make the other bastard die for his like Patton said right yeah. that type of mentality well so your mindset here is i'm just trying to wrap my head around because i of what psychologically is going on 
you had prepared yourself for this moment. This these this is two days basically, right? Yeah. For Over sure. the course of two days, from 1980 to 19, this would be 19, 91 to 1991. Yeah. You had been preparing for this day. 100. percent Yeah. And it all comes boiling down to like, fuck. We're in a gas station, and there's an enemy tank or an enemy personnel character j- just parked outside. Yep. And we have to take it out, or we're gonna die. And then following that, there's people. We think some of them went into this building out there. Did you ever go back and look inside the? No. You know what happened. No. You yeah. get it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Does, also, you know, I mean, you're dealing with armor. Yeah. You know, and you're not. You know, your whole job in like a Marine Corps or even special operations is not even to get yourself involved in an armor battle, right? Because you're going to lose. You know, you're. I'm in a Humvee with law rockets, and you know they have huge amount of armor, armor and yeah they could just rip us apart so so when you guys shot that i'm just i'm calling it a personnel carrier yeah it, that's that what it, it was? was yeah did it go did you know it went through both sides through both sides yeah okay and this was this personnel carrier was not like where do they get their stuff from um russians you know it was so interesting because um during the battle when we were going through it's like during the attack, we found stuff from like Czechoslovakia. We found stuff from Turkey. We found stuff from all over the place. Weapons that okay. the Iraqis had purchased over the years. You know, interesting. So, yeah. So okay. And then, do you ever sit back and go? Do you still think about the, the, that moment to this? Oh day? yeah, we celebrate, not celebrate, but we remember remember Spirit Zero Three yearly. Okay. Yeah, we. Uh, uh, do you ever think about moments in that gas station? Like, do you ever oh, sure. dream about it? And No, I don't dream about it. I think about it. You know, like I said, I was 27, so it wasn't, you know, I I, I was mature. You know, I was a, a team leader trained to do that, you know. Um, it's just combat's violent. It's loud. Yeah. <laughs> it's quick. Um, it smells. That's one thing I don't like. I I big into shooting, and I like to shoot. And if you accidentally don't put your earplugs in out at the range one day, it's like, oh yeah. my god! Like you don't understand. You can't hear sure. anything after a shot, and you don't wear earplugs sure. out on the battlefield. Sure. So you just de- were you just deaf those two days, basically. Uh, you know what? I think that I was probably just m- like more in shock, just more like your adrenaline. Yeah, is just, just adrenaline, tanked. just going, 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 going. You know, um, um. I think that. It's what my job is. Yeah. Our job was you're to do. You're just doing your job. So, you yeah, know, we're you're just not, doing our job. You're I mean, not thinking like I'm thinking. No. I mean, I think that, you know, we were, that was our mission. That was our job to go to coffee. And that was our mission to get these guys out. <clears throat> you know, after the Battle of Coffee, went and did another major mission. So, I mean, we we're all prepared. You know, we kind of just can wipe your hands and move on. But I, I agree. Going back and looking at it, you know, it was a, it was a great battle that we won. Yeah. You know, um, kind of changed the tipping point of like the Gulf War a little bit and the momentum our way. And to put it into perspective, from my memory, I never knew of the Iraqis other than invading Kuwait. That's kind of where I would argue that most of us back here, that's all we thought they did. Right. We never knew they moved into Saudi Arabia. Correct. But they, so they were going to just keep going. Sure. There was until somebody stopped them. Exactly. And that was you guys. Exactly. You know, when the armor columns were coming down into Kachi, you know, the Air Force and, you know, the, they were nailing them. But they were, you know, they had like 250 to 500 armored vehicles that kind of came into the Iraqis. Kachi. Yeah, the Iraqis had, at, uh, at that time. So when the Battle of Kachi was over, um, 10 days later, our entire unit moved east for the main uh, attack. Which was based into Kuwait. Into Kuwait. Okay. And um, at that time, um, uh, we were attached to the First Marine Division. I was giving my next mission, which was to go 18 kilometers inside Iraq, and set up for the assault. So my team, I was the in charge of the um, mission. My team and Chuck's team, two five six man teams were inserted so we went 18 kilometers inside iraq to a fo- satellite photo of where they wanted me to go which was kind of um remember back when they had the uh 
the mind felt the mind the mind belt of all whatever he Iraq he called it whatever it was I forget what's um, called the uh, mind belt anyway so we went up to the mind belt that he built and through satellite photos there was a path that they thought that we could get through um, and so they sent me up there to go look at it okay and so we got inserted we basically walked um, in 18 kilometers during that during that time is when they were starting to cap, take off all the, um, uh, flood all the mine, I mean, the oil fields with the oil. So we could hear like, what the fuck is that? There's, on our map, there's no running water. We were pitch, pitch dark at night wearing EVG goggles and everything. And uh, we were carrying a shit, shitload of um, uh, ammo. Our rucksacks probably weighed 80 to 110 pounds. Well, they were cutting all the uh, uh, yeah. oil dikes. And so the, what we were hearing was the oil, oil rushing by. Oh, my God. <clears throat> and so, so we made it up to where we had to go. And we were behind these big, probably 36-inch oil pipes. We dug holes behind them, and we stayed there. Slept. Um, pardon me? No, just, just stayed there. Just stayed there for the day. We observed everything because you don't the day. move at during the day you don't move the day so at nighttime eric and i my assistant team leader eric kenny's went through we found a path all the way through the other side um there was so this is in february so he laid all the mines in august september so and we say he were talking about Saddam. Oh, Saddam, saying. yeah, had put all the mines in. So what happened is that there have been so many storms and windstorms that you could see all the fucking mines exposed everywhere. <laughs> so you look, but they were everywhere, you know. And you know, you didn't know if they were somewhere buried or some were not. And and so you're walking through this at night, walking 18 miles, 16 miles, and you're you're constantly looking for his mines. No, this is when we went. We're actually at the mine belt. Oh, okay. You're yeah, at. We had we had already made it to where we were supposed to be. Okay. And so now we're looking for the gap in the mine belt. So they put a gap in it where they could drive trucks all the way through to the front of the mine belt, and then they would go back. So they made they made a lane. The Iraqis for made themselves. a lane for themselves. Well, they we caught it on satellite photo, so they sent me there to go check it out, and so sure shit we found it, and so we took little infrared. Uh, markers and put them where you could see them. So you can't see them unless you have MVG goggles on. So they look, they're, wow. they're, uh, they're naked to the eye. So the next morning <clears throat> we're in our hides and we look up and we see a couple F-16s flying over and then they come back around. We're like, oh fuck, here they come. They picked this up on infrared. You two guys. Our two teams. Okay. We were separated probably three or 400 uh, feet apart. And they dropped 200, two 250-pound bombs on us. Two Air, Fort, uh, Air Force F-16s. And so you guys kind of knew like, shit, they don't know. They don't know we're here. Air Force. Were they Air Force? They were Air Force. So they dropped. So there's no way those guys, they just think you're Iraqis. So, so what happened was they were under the orders that in five days there's going to be an invasion so any disposable ordnance you have drop it on the mine belt well the two pilots obviously picked up us on infrared and they thought that we were iraqis so the first guy came by dropped a bomb missed us but we got blown out of our hides like this up in the air boom boom the second guy came by, dropped one bomb, he missed us. Then the other guy came back around and I got out of my hide and popped a red flare and exposed ourselves okay. just so we wouldn't get killed. Right. So <clears throat> we're on the radio, we're on the radio going, hey man, you know. Jesus, I'd have been on the radio like, fucking stop. Well, it, it, happened, it happened so quick. Yeah. So we're on the radio going, hey, get these fuckers out of here. Someone's dropping bombs on us. and. We always, wherever we go, we have a 
cap with us. It's a combat air patrol that usually is overhead and okay, watches yeah, all. Okay, you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, from w- country, uh, yeah. that watches us or you know keeps an eye, and we w- they always know where we're at. So they got a hold of the Air Force jets, and um, they basically told them who we were, and they were kind enough to stay on station until we got evacuated out. So <clears throat> we ended up. You know, here, here they are. Did flying. they say sorry? <laughs> here they are flying over us, and we're like, "Oh fuck, man!" We can hear rumbling. We're like, "Oh boy, we're in trouble, right?" We hear rumbling, 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 and thank God it was cobras. Oh, they came all the way up, and uh, cobras helicopters. Yeah, cobra helicopters came. They picked us up. They flew us back um, to Third Marine headquarters where a guy named Colonel John Admire was standing there waiting for me. And I went in and I saw him. Now, I've been in, probably awake for three or four days at this, this time. And uh, No sleep. No sleep. They called me by my first name back then. He's like, Billy, go get something to eat. You're going right back out. And so I went and got something to eat. And Eric and I, my assistant team leader, just the two of us went back out. Uh, with a reinforced back uh, out to the path went right back out to the path with uh, a guy named uh, Mike McCuster and he had like a reinforced state platoon like snipers and uh, an infantry like a platoon of infantry from third marines okay men yeah men yeah we went and uh, went back um, this is probably at three o'clock in the morning they sent I led the first uh, platoon through. They set up a whole perimeter on the other side of the mine belt, the Iraqi side. Um, uh, about 4.35 in the morning, right when the sun, well, about 5.30 when the sun came up, um, you could see like a company of Marines on the friendly side. And then about four Amtraks came up with those big, um, they shoot like bombs. Oh, yeah, it's basically tracks. With yeah, yeah, they shoot these uh, C4 bombs. I forget what they're called. But they shot them over the mine belt and just blew holes in the mine belt, right? Okay. And uh, so here's Eric and I. Um, we find a little hole that was right by the uh, where we had been before. You got Yeah, and right as the sun came up, Eric and I are sitting there in our chair, I mean, in, in the hole, and we look back, and there's got to be 40,000, 50,000 Marines coming through. We sat there for an hour and a half just watched Marines. Woo, 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 tanks. Woo, 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 fly through. <sighs> Woke up two hours later. We're the only motherfuckers there. Everyone, nobody's around. <laughs> what? Nobody's around. Did nobody stop and grab us? Nobody's around. We're like, what the fuck? Dude, I have, I, I'm not wearing any rank. We didn't wear any rank. I haven't shaved. Eric hadn't shaved in four or five days. Sun We're nasty. I, 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 I'm like, I don't have, you know, we're wearing desert boots and all this shit. And we look up and I swear to God, not one person's around. Just silent. We, yeah, we fell asleep for like two hours. Um, so we ended up like, God damn, what the hell? Like, like we're trying to, we have a little uh, HF radio and we're trying to call, call, call. And finally, a chow truck comes by. We get in the back of a chow truck and go all the way up to the Kuwaiti International Air Force, I mean, airport that day and hooked up with uh, a unit. But that was quite a week. So that, I mean, because I remember that. Convoy, you still see video from that to the day of that convoy. Oh yeah, going through and going into Kuwait because then it was th- that's the anticlimactic part, right? They basically sure. surrendered. They were as done. Forty thousand Marines. Yeah, they were descended done. upon them. Yeah, exactly. They were done. But basically, it was you two guys, two guys, Eric and I. Yep. That were the first two. Yep. To go in, be past enemy lines. Yep. On foot. 100%. So they were flying things yeah. in. I was awarded a Bronze Star for that mission. Wow. With a combat B for that. So it wasn't, it was an important mission. Too. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, from my perspective, that's, that's nuts. I mean, I can't even, I moved here to LA when I was 28 and I was 
distraught because I couldn't find an apartment. Meanwhile, you're sitting in a hole <laughs> in the <laughs> desert, getting blown two feet uh, off the ground. Yeah. How loud was that when those, when those F-16s were dropping on you? Loud. It's a percussion. And could you hear it? Could you hear it like... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you could hear it coming. So you just hunkered oh, down oh, and we you... We curled up in like little balls. Did you think, we're dead? It's going to hit right on us and we're dead. When he circled back around, it's when I thought, oh boy, he's coming right after us again. That's when we had to compromise ourselves, you know? Yeah. To when you did compromise yourself with the flare, did you get it? Did, did, any, did any enemy fire come no. from that? They, were, they had already they, retreated. They had, yep, they had already retreated. Okay. So, yep. And so, yeah, it was kind of just an interesting week that week. So, you know, getting. That's an interesting week. <laughs> yeah. So what did you do this week, Billy? Well, but when oh, I say getting back to you, saying is that, you know, I mean, you know, these guys, like, you know, active teams and like MARSOC or SILS, you know, that's, that's their job. They get paid to do that. You know, we get extra pay for hazardous duty pay, you get extra pay for jump school, scuba, all that stuff. You know, it's, it, and, and you're not a young man. They don't take. 19 year olds and make them right you, you know team leaders and you know marsoc or seals or anything you know you you've, you're i was 27 you know I, right which is old that's yeah it's old in the military old per in se. The military, yeah. yeah you know so and now what i'm just trying to think what made you decide like what what is the decision in the marine corps because typically you just go in for what four years and then you're yeah. out yeah kind of like college exactly but you stayed obviously for 12 years so you became a career military man a career marine what made you decide to do that or what how did just that... all the all, whole marsoc thing you know i was a swimmer i was you know it's a whole you were just uh, into it you yeah, loved I was all totally of it. into it and then to at that point i think um to actually it was an mos so it was, it was a job specialty in the marine corps it had just become at that time I think you had to re-enlist for six years or something to be like, to, to get into it deeply. Okay. You know? And so, you know, I got into it deeply. So you'd earned it. Yeah. So. Interesting. So then what, when, let's just, I don't know if we're jumping ahead too far, but like, when did you then leave Iraq? So. We left. We were the first ones there and the last ones to leave. Of course, <laughs> we missed all the You're parades. Like a PA. No, we, I know we used to watch, you know, on on the you know news and everything. Oh, I'll look at all the parades back home, New York. Oh, having all the parades for all the heroes. Everyone, welcome back. You're like still here. Yeah, still but you here. know, so still here in the Reverend. So uh, I think we left a good two months. Or maybe three months after the war. Flew back to uh, Hawaii. Everybody took leave except for me and a couple other guys. Like, why in the hell you want to go to Wisconsin when you take it take leave here in Hawaii? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> that would be dumb. <laughs> that so, would be dumb. So, That'd like three weeks later, I get a phone call and they're like, "Hey, you in town?" I'm like, "Yes, sir, Colonel." And he's like, uh, "Let's go down to uh, let's go to Pearl Harbor. I got a little something for you to do." So this is my last mission. I got out after this. So um, he's like, we, we're going to send you down to Tonga. I'm like, Tonga? Where the fuck's Tonga? Yeah. Right? And like, okay, Tonga's, you know, below the international date line runs through. It's below the equator and everything. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to Tonga. He goes, I want you to uh, bring two teams down there. Bring your Zodiac boats, all your stuff. and, oh, and teach favorite. Them, yeah, and teach them how to get on ships, how to how to radio room engine room you know all that stuff how to stop a ship because the japanese fishing fleets are coming into their international waters and they're illegally fishing and all they have is like one boat you know so we went down there for 40 days trained with the tongans you know it's just unbelievable beautiful beautiful place i mean you could 15 feet down look and you can see so you're training oh, the tongan military we're t yeah we're t uh, they're special operations guys that they put together. Okay. So I went down there for 40 days, finished that. We left some equipment there for the Tongans to keep training. And I came back and I went back to uh, a couple schools at Coronado. That's where we all train at, all the schooling. Coronado right here. Yeah, Coronado, California. SoCal, okay. Yeah, where all the SEALs and MARSOC train. And I went to, I was going through a school there and I got a call from my dad, and I was just coming up to the end of my enlistment. My father um, 
since has retired from the movie industry. Uh, he's spent 42 years in the film industry. And he's like, hey, uh, I know you're coming up on the end of your enlistment. You want to get out and make some good money and not get killed? <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Yeah. He did. Not, yeah. yeah. Not get killed? I was like, yeah, let me think about it. And then... <laughs> And I met a girl down there, and I was like, you know, okay, this is going to last forever. We're in love, which it didn't. But and I got out, and um, I got uh, military. I got discharged medically for hearing loss and concussions and stuff like that. And So you did sustain yeah, some stuff Yeah, so they gave me a bunch of money, and I have all my uh, uh, benefits at the VA. Okay. Which I don't use. Um Okay. So I got, basically got out, and then I, you know, started working for my father, who's a construction coordinator in the film industry. And we started, you know, I started pounding nails and learning the craft. And, you know, I think uh, my father did some great movies. You know, from Mission Impossible Two to, you know, um, I think his last movie was. Um, and that was roughly ninety. In the nineties, ninety three, ninety four. Yeah, um, his last movie was. Uh, Damn, what's the hell? Leo DiCaprio plays uh, Howard Hughes. The Aviator. So, my, you know, my father retired and I kind of took over, uh, uh, you know, doing what he did. You know, I didn't become a construction coordinator overnight. You know, it takes 15, 20 years yeah, to get you're the on knowledge. The crew first, yeah, right? you're on the crew and pounding it out and pounding it out. Um, and then, probably like 10 years ago, I got my construction coordinator's card and started doing movies and tv shows um so that transition going from i mean sitting in a gas station blowing up tanks to working in hollywood do you think that because you went right into work like there was no 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 downtime do you think that helped you mentally it helped me mentally and plus you're working with a bunch of men anyways in the you know construction field and still the same smoke and a joke and still going on and you can kind so of there's, and there's a hierarchy yeah if, if people don't know in in the crew and in in, in uh, Hollywood it's very much a hierarchy yeah hundred percent you know there's a prop maker gang boss foreman you know there's a there, there's definitely a chain of command you yeah. know per se you know um, uh, and so. Believe me, I, I'm still very much involved in that whole special operations community. I'm all of, Yeah, you've talked to me sometimes yeah, I about, mean, like, you get phone calls all the time. Yeah, I mean, we, we still communicate with each other. You know, we lost one of our team members last year in a surfing accident who was in the Battle of Kofchi with us. He was with me um, on the inv- invasion. So, anyway, so, yeah. and so I, you know, we're still closer, still a camaraderie with us all, you know. Um, a lot of guys from our teams have gone on to work for Blackwater. Their contractors. So they went into private sector. Yeah, they went to the private sector. You know, there's a. Do interview. you ever get called? Do you ever you ever get calls like, "Hey, come work in the private sector"? I, I have. And you say, uh, "No, okay. I still dibble there every once in a while." Okay. Yeah. So. Little consulting. A little consulting. Jobs. Yeah. There's a. Uh, something I can tell you off air. <laughs> yeah, okay. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, yeah. So, so now here I am at 61. Turn yeah. 61 Tuesday. That's uh, right. Happy that's birthday. right. Happy birthday. Right. Yeah. So now I have 30 years in the film industry. Yeah. And I've got my 60,000 or whatever hours to retire. So I'm almost done with this. Done with that too. Done with this too. Yeah. And we get, so we'll, You've worked. On, I'll I'll go into the movie stuff now. So you've worked on, you work on huge movies. You work with the Russo brothers. I do on most of their stuff. You do some TV stuff here and there, but mostly at this point, the last few years I've been talking to you, you're doing like you did the Gray Man. Did, you we were did the, the construction Man. coordinator. No, I, I was not. You Chris were. Chris Snyder was construction coordinator. Okay, but um, uh, so we just finished Gray Man, which was just a a phenomenal hit with Ryan Gosling. He's so sexy. Yeah. <laughs> he had the same. The other Ryan. Yeah. Not, not this one. He had the same scar for three weeks. The same open cut. I don't know. The Russo brothers. They, they, all right. But <laughs> yeah. see, I did Captain America with them. Um, so we just, so we did uh, Gray Man. Then we did uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 3. And then I took over a project 
called Tulsa Kings in Oklahoma City last year. And then I, we just finished Megalopolis with Francis Ford Coppola. 80, he was 83, just turned 84 last week. Wow. And okay, so, now you say you work with them in being a, either a construction coordinator or what uh, other I was a location. I did all the locations on Megalopolis for Chris. So you found locations? Yeah. No, they found that location manager found them, and we, I, I went in and set up. 80% of the movies was on location. Okay. And so we filmed everywhere in Atlanta. We filmed everywhere in, um, like, all sorts of crazy places, but it was all in Roman structure. So it was all like everything that we filmed. It was had a Roman theme to it. Okay. So for everybody that doesn't know, when you see when you're watching a movie, everything you see on the screen, ninety nine point eight percent of it is not an accident. It's all somebody like you has touched it or set it up, sure, or built it. Sure. So let's go to Gray Man. I don't know if anybody's seen Gray Man, but tell us about like what what in that like I remember there being some pretty amazing sets in well, that movie. What uh, you- my job on that was to build the C one thirty. So the opening scene or where they're in the plane themselves, we built yep. that from scratch. We built it with metal rings. Um, we built the interior, exterior, we put it on airbags and a gimbal. And so the entire fight scene and everything was on a gimbal. And, and a gimbal airbags. means it, it moves. It moves it. up and down or airbags with um, uh, air that leaks, you know, to make them go up and down. So that it looks really real. Exactly. And so um, that was a, actually a project that lasted the whole film. And then um, my next project was the little uh, fireworks barge that they had a big fight in and everything like that. Um, so... It was a, f- a fun movie. Now I've done funner movies. You know, we did. What's the, uh, one, what's, the what's the funnest one you've done? Uh, working with Mel Gibson's pretty fun. Yeah, uh, he's a pretty cool guy. What did you work with Mel Gibson on? Uh, we were soldiers. Um, uh, what else have I done with Mel? Uh, Maverick. We did Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and Quentin Tarantino's a very interesting character too. Um, I, I I I like him. Um, but he's he's a he's a joke teller that laughs at his own jokes before anyone gets it. I've seen that in his <laughs> interviews. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so he'll tell the joke and then start laughing. Okay. And you're like, okay, I, I guess we're get, supposed to start laughing. Yeah, I don't get. What are we talking about? <laughs> so in, in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, what 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 did, what were you hands on with in that? Oh, geez. Um, re, I redid a Taco Bell. Uh, I did the. They'll redid it into what? Just redid it? So just redid it. Because um, uh, when you used to be able to walk through the old uh, Taco Bells, you used to walk through the arches. Now all the arches have glass in them. You have to go through the double doors. But when we grew up, you can go to Taco Bell, and all the arches around the restaurant were open. It was a walk-up window. Oh, yeah. And so they're all boarded up. Because what year <clears> was Once Upon a Time Highwood set in 72? Exactly. Something like that. Then we did a Del Taco or a Pup, Pup and Taco. And then I did the Nazi scene because you right. got to have a Nazi scene in every Tarantino film. Right. Yeah. And yeah. So I did the Nazi scene up in Malibu Canyon there with them. With the, uh, the township where Manson was staying, the little, the little fake town where Charlie Manson was living or no, no, it was, uh, the one where they had a big shootout in the, um, Oh, right. The cabin. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm with you now. So well, that's interesting. Yeah. And then, um, you know, just doing Megalopolis, working with Francis Ford Coppola it was just an When abs- is that coming out? Um, well, we wrapped three weeks ago. And I know that he's hired more editors, but um, I'm not sure. But just working with him, just seeing how he directs and how his uh, command presence is, is very, very interesting. Um, there was stuff that I all of us thought would never, ever work. Um, how it was set up for film, and it just turned out on film gorgeous and he's just you know um magical in the way that yeah, he does he's... things you know he's a quirky man he um roman was there to help him out every day his son okay and uh, they both show up every single day with uh suit and ties on um until the last four days of filming on the show and francis decided he wanted to retire <laughs> so, 
So the last four days of filming, this is great. Tell that story. <laughs> he, yeah. he, last four days, four days of uh, filming on Megalopolis last month, he showed up in his pajamas. He's the boss. He financed it all. So it was a. Uh, very oh, interesting wow. yeah that's interesting yeah so yeah he financed the whole movie himself huh so I, I probably should know that but i didn't know that yeah i think he sold in the 70s he made uh like whatever millions off american graffiti and bought the eagle nook winery um up in napa and I, he sold a portion of that to finance megalopolis so see that's to me that you like they they say in Hollywood that you're never supposed to finance your own projects, but I feel like that's what I would like to do, you know, because I've gone out and dealt with getting investors on my small little projects, you know, it's nothing compared to them, but it's still a headache. Yeah. Like getting the money and pitching people and trying to convince them like, Netflix offered him money too. And he turned it down because he, didn't want people, them, he, cause he the, wanted control. He wanted a whole control of it. So, so I think that is this is a very good example of letting the artists have the control. So we'll see how it comes out. Sure. You know, because the, the studio executives always say, like, oh, you can't have artists in control of everything because you'll end up with a crazy mess. And all the artists say, like, you can't let the, you know, the suits have all the control because you're going to end up with something that's just not good. You're going to end up with a bland, not good film. Sure. I agree. I mean, um, take it for example, what's happening or just happened the last couple of years with James Gunn and Disney, you know, with uh, the whole Marvel franchise, he was fired and they rehired him yeah. because of, because of his directing skills. Cause he's got know? a right brain to him. As yeah. I say. He's got a creative brain. And so he is no longer has a contract with Marvel. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 was the last of, of that. So what happened right away? Warner Brothers hires him to do five pictures for uh, uh, Superman and the whole... Oh, right, that uh, big shake-up. Because he, that big he shake decided ups. what was going to be, so, which movies were going to be made and which weren't. So they hired James Gunn to go take care of that whole franchise. So, you know, the talent is there, you yeah. know? So, yeah. It's so funny to me how... There's so much pressure and so much money and so, so serious about the movie industry in juxtaposition to you sitting in a hole, getting blown two feet into the air. And that, to me, should be taken seriously. But the stuff that we do, I think some people, I think they lose perspective. I agree. So one thing I have a problem with our business is that nothing needs to be done ASAP. Nothing needs to be. No. It's like, this is an emergency. This has to be done right away. It's like, oh, hold on. No, it doesn't. Emergency is popping a red flare so an F-16, F-15 doesn't. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so that's what an emergency. And I think <laughs> you just solved all the world's problems because in my job and in your job yeah. and in my wife's job, so many people are like, I need that. This is an emergency. Like all caps, emails, all the time, right. all ASAP. day long. ASAP. I needed this yesterday. <laughs> no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Because there's not an F-16 coming at you, and yeah. there's not a baby about to die. So don't talk to me about an emergency. Unless you yeah. are in the military, or you are a doctor, or you are in the emergency service sure. business, there are no emergencies. I'm sorry. If you don't get the backdrop to this scene in Gray Man finished by Tuesday, it gets done by on Friday. You push the movie. Who cares? Like, it's fine. It's fine. You, your movie can come out when exactly. it comes out, and people are either going to see it or they're not going to see it. Like, oh well, we have to come out on this weekend. All right, whatever. Hundred percent. If agree. it doesn't come out on that weekend, is anybody going to die? Do you need to send a flare in no. the air? No. 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 So it's no. not an emergency. Not an emergency. Not at all. People are going to love that. People are going to be like, well, you don't understand this business and how much money's at stake. No, I do. 100%. I 100%. I get it. Money's at stake. Are people's lives at stake? Nah. But, you know, even looking at a movie and there's 300 or 500 people on a movie, only three or four people are making a profit. Yeah. You know. Exactly. We're hurrying up for the producers or executive producers. Yeah. They're just worried about their bottom line. And it's dangerous. I mean, look at what, look at. 
I mean, what happened on Rust with the Alec Baldwin thing? You, you and I both know how these pressure cookers, especially low budget stuff, because time is money. Yes, that's true, and that's the reason why the railroad track accident happened with that that director. Yep. That that where she lost her life, and then Rust was like, I guarantee you, it's because everybody's rushing. And somebody is stomping their fucking foot, going, come on, come on, come on, go, give me, come on, we got to shoot this. Here, here's yeah, the yeah, gun. Yeah, 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 no, 100%. Okay, I and action. All right, freeze, yeah, bang. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there was real bullets in there? Yeah, yeah. well, of course, something, who knows what happened. Oh. I'm, I'm saying this is all hyperbole at this point, if that's the right no, word. No, I, I agree with you, though. There, we're too much in a hurry, and, you know, and I think that the more low-budget, films there are they need to keep an eye on it more you know yeah. especially hiring qualified people to do their yeah jobs you know like i did a quarter of a million dollar movie or half a million dollar movie and you, we were rushing that's not enough money to make a movie and we were rushing constantly and i remember specifically noticing that people were a little bit too tired and there was this one guy that at, was we wrapped at whatever we'd been shooting since 5 a.m and we wrapped at midnight which that's a lot. It's a long day. That yeah, is. I mean, if you if you at home work an eight or ten hour day, that's what you do regularly. Sure. Five a.m. to midnight, yeah. regularly. You are beat. And then this guy was like, "I got to get in the car and I got to drive home." He lives three hours away. And we're like, "You're not driving home." Yeah, put him in a hotel. So we put him in a hotel, and like at least we had the the sense at that point to do that because like we didn't have the money to do sure. that. You know, you didn't have. Three hundred dollars for a hotel means that's a cameraman for the day that we lost. Right. But it didn't matter because we were just like, let's just pump the brakes here. We're just making a stupid comedy movie. <laughs> we're not sending flares into the air here. Sure. Was that your? Yeah, that was the sixty-yard line. Okay. How'd that? Go, how'd that do? Good. It's, it's we broke even. Good. Yeah. There's a lot of middlemen involved, so the net net, it's we're still. We were just talking about the middlemen. Yeah, we were just talking about the middlemen. Yeah. But no, it's doing good. It's okay. doing good. So if you haven't seen the 60-yard line, go for it. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So we're, what's, uh, what are you working on now? What's your next? I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a little time off. I've been basically gone for like two because years. Because you can retire. Yeah, I can retire now, but I won't. I'll work for a couple more years, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do. And just so you know, when he's saying I've been gone, when you go, when you said you went to Oklahoma and Atlanta... You are away from your wife and your three kids the whole time. The last six months I've been home. Well, actually, in the last year, I've been home six weeks. Yeah, see, that's... I'll give you permission to take a little time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, plus the yard work I got to pick up on, and hopefully the sun will come out here some sooner or later. Oh, my God. It's like... And my parents back in Wisconsin... Is a drought like they have fire warnings That's what I've back there? Heard it's like a big, they just, some big marsh just started on fire. Unbelievable. We switched. So uh, your military project about the vets? Oh yeah, we make great pets. Make make good pets. Yeah. So I did a. I'm pitching a show called We Make Great Pets. It's a, a show about a Afghan war vet with PTSD that signs up for a experimental treatment to rehabilitate him back into society because he's got PTSD so bad he's drinking and so yeah you've been helpful on that as well so so yes that's what I'm that's my number one project see what we can do to help you out okay well that would be that would be much appreciated because I'm stuck should we uh, you gotta send this to all your buddies so they can yeah it'll be fun yeah they'll like it because I want to get them on too oh yeah for sure we'll have to talk to Big Dave and get him over here Yeah, yeah for sure that'd be great and you'll have to be on that one too then Oh, 100%. Okay. Because I, I am, like I said, these are my favorite stories. And what we just heard from you is absolutely fucking bananas. Like, just that whole Kafji thing is really, it, it blew my mind. It blows yeah. my mind. Yeah. I was a young man. But, you know, like I said, we were just trained to what we are doing. And, you know, yes, it's, you say that, though. You, you keep saying, like, <laughs> oh, it's just what we were trained to do. And it's like, yeah, but... At one point, I feel like my mind would go, yes, I've been trained to do this, but like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah, I know. See, that's why I'm yeah. not. Yeah. You're either cut out to be in the military or not, and I'm not because my com- my comedian brain would kick in and go, what are we doing? This this is, what are we doing right now? Let's get the fuck out of this Let's gas get out station. Of here, right? 
I'm yeah. not going to sit at this gas station yeah, anymore. 100%. Yeah. But, hey. I get it. I get you've it. been great. Well, thank you. Thanks yeah, sure. for sitting in that gas station. Yeah, no problem, buddy. For us. Yeah. Because that, who knows where that would have ended. So you stopped. You nipped that in the bud. And uh, thanks for doing the show. And we'll have you back on. All right, brother. Cool. Take care. Yeah, take care.